Thanks, Daniel. <coughs> As he said, I'm going to try to talk maybe 20 minutes uh, and just uh, hopefully have some uh, questions you might ask. Uh, if it's okay, I prefer to wait till after the 20 minutes before we ask the questions, so just so I don't lose my track. <laughs> I don't want to pretend that I that the methods that I talk about tonight are the only methods of looking after an outdoor rink. There's all kinds of different ways of doing it. A lot of it depends on uh, your infrastructure, the equipment you have at your disposal, uh, whether you've got uh, many volunteers available or hardly anybody uh, helping. There's a lot of different factors. So I'll talk about the methods that I use, uh, but uh, please, uh, there's, I don't want to give anybody the impression that my methods are the only ones that, uh, that you should be following. One of the big advantages that I have is I live very close to the outdoor rink that I maintain. My backyard literally is from here to that door away from the back, uh, back doors. So. so the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, you know, so why would you want to look after an outdoor rink? Uh, for me, it, you know, I, well, if I can get two more years in, actually, I'll have 30 years of service and I'll get my gold watch. Well, thank you. And then, uh, but no, for me, it's, it was always about watching kids out there getting exercise, playing hockey, skating, getting them away from their TVs and their, their video games and, and whatnot. Uh, it's also a great opportunity to give back to the community. Uh, there's different ways to volunteer, all kinds of opportunities. But for me, looking after an outdoor rink was always uh, something that I always admired as a child. I had a friend whose father used to put in an outdoor rink and I was always in awe about the work that he used to put in to maintain this rink for so it's something that stayed with me. Uh, I get a lot of exercise, it's the only exercise I get, you can tell. Uh, and also, uh, honestly, my winters fly. People say, oh, it's such a long winter. I, I honestly can tell you that once once my rink is up and running uh, and the end of February comes around, it's a blur. I don't know where it went. That's funny. So before you want to start your base ice, you want to make sure that your equipment is properly functioning. Check your hoses, make sure they're not leaking, make sure your water system is, uh, is operating properly. Because once you do get that ideal temperature and you want to get started, the last thing you want is a, a delay that prevents you to take advantage of the weather. Um, another big challenge about base ice is whether or not you should flood directly on grass or whether you have a rink that has a, a paved surface or a concrete surface or whether you're going to use a packed snow base. I know that me personally, when I started this uh, 27 or 28 years ago, the person that I took over from, he, in fact, used to live in the house that I'm in now, but he used to, uh, he used to just wait, and he'd remove all the snow, let the frost get into the grass, and then once he got a cold snap, uh, two, three days, he'd pull his hoses out, he'd just let the water run for two hours, and then he'd go out and move it later on, and that's all he did. He just wait, let, let Mother Nature do the job. So, I tried that for the first few years and it worked okay, but I, I found it took a long time. It, it, I, I wasn't patient enough to, to, uh, to wait that out. So I remember coming to one of these training sessions that the city was putting on, they had a manual and the way they were talking about was to use a packed snow base. So I decided to give that a try 25 years ago and I've never looked back, I've never had any regrets about using a packed snow base. Uh, now, if, you, uh, if you're going to use a packed snow base, you want to make sure you need the ideal conditions. You need 10 to 15 centimeters of snow, uh, followed by two or three days of clear, cold weather. You, know, you don't want any snow coming back at you once you start uh, packing your base and doing your flooding, because otherwise, if you do a couple of floods and then you got to remove the snow, it's a real challenge. So ideally, you want to get the snow base, but then you want to get a couple of cold, clear days. Um, if you're looking after a facility that's got a, a paved surface or a concrete surface, you don't really need a packed snow base, you can go ahead and start right away. You just need a bit of snow to pack along the lower ends of your rink, you know, to, to make some slush so that you're not losing your water. But other than that, you don't need a snow base. But even with a snow base, I looked after the Bayshore rink in uh, a couple of years and we put in a snow base and it, it's a lot easier because you don't have those uneven issues to deal with. So. Uh, you're, I was up and running in, uh, in no time with the snow base and I had three inches of solid ice uh, before uh, once we got skating on it, so it wasn't a problem. Um, it takes me uh, about 70 man hours, person hours I guess, to, uh, to get up and running once I pack the snow and start doing all the flooding and, and, and to be able to say, okay, we can have skaters. 
it's about 70 man hours so you don't want to jump the gun you know it was tempting last week even to get started with that snow that we had but it just wasn't cold enough and the reality is you could put in 70 hours of work and then watch it all flow down the street and start all over next week so generally speaking before mid-december you're running a risk if you jump too early next so if you once you start uh, the first thing i do is i remove the brackets the inner brackets inside the boards and I contravenes the manual. The city has a manual, and in there, it's, it's, I, I, I abide by that manual, except for the part where they say, leave the brackets in until after your base ice is done. That's a big mistake, because then you're gonna be chopping these things out. Get those brackets off before you pack your snow. That's, it saves you a lot of work. But, uh, and then once, what I do is, uh, for packing my snow base, I'm fortunate to have access to an, an all-terrain vehicle, those four wheel, those quad bikes. And I've also got a 40 inch lawn roller. So I hook up the roller to my bike and I drive around the thing. I'll cover the same area two, maybe three times, pack it all down. And then once that's done, I, I have this uh, 10 foot six by six beam that I drag behind. And what that does is it, uh, it knocks down the ridges and it drops the snow down into the valley. So it helps me get my surface relatively level. Uh, there's no such thing as an outdoor rink on grass that's level. They've all got low spots for drainage and whatnot. Some of them are really bad, others not so bad. But they've all got unevenness and they've all got ridges and valleys. And so you wanna to try to use techniques that will help you uh, get, get that leveled off as, as soon as possible. And then after I've used that beam, I've got this other, about an eight foot mesh, wire mesh screen that's fairly heavy. And I drag that around to knock down the heavy clumps and, I end up with a relatively smooth surface. I also make sure that I, you know, I pack all along the boards, use snowshoes, uh, and I really pay attention to tire tracks, or ridges, things that are obvious, a clump. You see a clump there's no step on it. It takes a lot less effort to crush down that clump than it does to try to flood two inches of water to cover it. So you wanna really pay attention as much as possible to have as smooth a surface as possible before you pull your hose. And then once I do pull the hose, uh, it's a long process. It's basically, uh, you, you've got a fire hose with a nozzle, you've got a fine, fine spray. You're working an area of 10 feet by 10 feet at a time. And uh, it's, you just stand there and you let the water, you don't dry the water into the snow, you let the water land on top of the snow. And you stand there until it gets saturated. It turns gray, you see it turning dark gray. That's saturated, then you move over to the next 10 feet. It's a long process, that's when you need helpers to be able to relieve each other. It takes me uh, eight to 10 hours, uh, that process to flood the border rink and the siding. So, but once that's done, I've got three inches of solid ice. And after that, I can handle snowfalls, I can handle melts, I can handle rain, because I've got those three inches of ice. It makes a huge difference. If you don't mind, I'll, uh, if you don't have a backhoe or a quad, how do you pack your snow? Uh, good question. I remember one year I didn't have access to it. I called out a bunch of neighbors and said, bring out your snowshoes. And everybody was out there in snowshoes. It really didn't take that long. You know, that helped a lot. Some people use trucks. They just drive back and forth for vehicles, uh, snowmobiles. Uh, it's just, I don't know. Some, what some people have to use cars. Some people use trucks. I've, I've heard of people using trucks and driving back and forth. If you don't mind, I prefer to wait till after for the questions, if it's okay. And in that picture, the one that before that, that was my son sitting on a chair. When you're standing there with that hose for eight to 10 hours, even if it's two hours, it's hard on the back. It's hard on the 62 year old back, I can tell you that. Okay, uh, so to, uh, to complete the base ice, uh, how many floods are you going to need? Again, it largely depends on how smooth your surface is. Uh, but in my case, uh, and I pay quite a bit of attention to it, but because of all the unevenness, it takes me on average 10 to 12 floods uh, for my rink uh, before I can actually say, okay, it's ready for skating. Uh, one of the things you have to watch out for, you have a tendency to want to put down a lot of water because you, 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 want, to, you want to move it along and you're in a hurry. And, but if what happens if you put too much water down it creates other problems uh, you'll get uh, if it's not cold enough the water won't freeze fast enough and what happens is it starts draining out at the low ends of your rink and every rink has a low end 
Some of them are really bad, but they all have low ends, yes. So you gotta watch out for that, because what happens is you do a flood and then you go back out there and you get, before you do your next flood, check it out, check out your surface area and find out if you've got any issues. And the big one is shellites. And you'll, you'll see you've got cavities where you flood it and it's just air. There's a bit of a thin layer of ice and then it's pockets of air underneath it. What happens there, that's called shellites. And what's happening there is you're putting down too much water and the water is seeping out from underneath and it's seeping out through the board or seeping out through your snow banks, or whatever. So you're, you're not making any progress. If you pour more water, it just keeps seeping out. So what I do is, uh, after I do a flood, I, again, I try not to be too aggressive. I'd rather do thin floods repetitively. If it's a cold day, if it's minus 15 out during the day, you can do a flood every couple of hours. Again, if you've got helpers, volunteer, that's when you can really teamwork it and, and, uh, and move things along. Before I do it, after I finish a flood, put away the hose, and then I'll walk around the, the perimeter of the low ends of the rink, and I'll check, I'll look for it, see if there's water seeping out, and, and you'll find it. You'll see slushy snow or whatever. So then I'll take a bit of time and I'll pack that with slush and let that freeze up as well, so that the next flood, hopefully some of it won't seep out. You know, it, it, it improves every flood, but you gotta pay attention to that, otherwise you're wondering where all your water's going. Next one. So for the ongoing maintenance, uh, you need uh, you need the equipment. You, you're gonna have to uh, scrape and flood regularly. I think the contract says four times a week. Uh, I try and scrape and I try and flood every night. If the weather allows me to, I flood. The thicker your ice base, uh, the longer, uh, the better it'll withstand those melting periods and whatnot. So uh, I try to flood every night unless unless it's snowing. Um, you need good equipment. What I use, uh, I use uh, custom-made scrapers. You see one on the on the left there. There, there are steel scrapers you can buy from uh, Preston Hardware. Canadian Tire, I don't even think they sell them. It's all plastic. But if you go to Preston Hardware, they sell steel scrapers, 24 inch. I'll get two of those, and I'll bring them to a welder and have them welded together with a handle. And I'll get a couple of those made. It costs about a hundred dollars to the two scrapers, have it welded. It's about a hundred dollars. But I find that these scrapers do a very good job. I don't leave them out, they're not for pushing snow. I use them exclusively for my pre-flood cleanup. You know, uh, after the skaters are gone, my helper and I will pull out these scrapers and then we clean it off. Uh, do, it does a pretty good job of cleaning it off. And I use those uh, before the flood. Um, the other thing I do is I have a straw broom. Uh, you, you'll see it on the next picture, but right I sweep out the edges of the boards and I don't know how many people do it, but I think it's well worth doing it. It takes about an extra 20 minutes and I just take the, the broom and I just sweep the snow out right where the ice meets the boards, right in that 90 degree angle. It's not a lot of snow to move, just take that snow out of there and it pays dividends. What happens if you don't do that, it starts building up into that 90 degree angle, the pucks start slipping up onto the boards and it gets progressively worse, it becomes harder and harder to clean your ice properly. So I sweep that out every uh, before I flood. It takes me 20 minutes ahead of the other guy, and it, it's worth the effort. And then when I flood, I uh, I use a, just a, those red nozzles that that, uh, that Dino will talk about. So you get them at Preston Hardware, one inch uh, fire hose nozzle. I usually try to use about a medium spray. The thin I find that the thinner the thinner a flood that I put down is better because it, for some reason the ice seems to freeze harder as opposed to putting down a lot of water. So I, I try to do a thin flood, just enough to, basically it's like you're washing the garage floor. You know, just wet it down kind of thing. That's all I do. And I find the ice freezes harder and it's, it's, uh, it can sustain the heavier action. And then the other thing I've got here is it's uh, on the right hand side, it's a, a homemade rink rake. They used to sell these things at Canadian Tire. It's basically a, about eight feet. It's got holes, one eighth of an inch holes, about an inch apart on the bottom of it. And then when I drag this thing along with the with the cloth, it leaves a smooth, smooth surface. I don't use it that often. I use it for uh, special occasions. If we run an, uh, say a hockey tournament, we might have eight, 10 hockey games on the ice and it gets really ripped up. So after a couple of games, I can pull that out and I can give it a flood within uh, 15 minutes and it's hard in five minutes because it's such a thin layer. It's like a Zamboni. It freezes very, very rapidly. Next slide. 
So snow removal, you know, people say, oh, you look after an outdoor rink, and the first thing that comes to mind is you're standing there with a hose. But in reality, if you wanted a true picture of what it's like to maintain an outdoor rink, you're standing there with a shovel or you're pushing a snowblower. Because the biggest part of this job is snow removal. Without doubt, that is the biggest challenge. So you want to really plan that out and figure out how you're going to tackle that issue. There's a number of ways to do it. Uh, some rinks uh, you will use uh, commercial contractors, negotiate a, a contract like a seasonal fee or whatever, and they'll come out and <coughs> move your snow uh, whenever there's, I don't know, five centimeters, whatever your arrangement is. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, one thing, uh, one word of caution, though, if you're gonna do that, these people use heavy equipment, big heavy tires with knobs on them, and uh, they'll leave like a bit of a packed trail on the ice. And if you're not there to remove that right away, that becomes a bit of an issue, because it freezes into the ice and then you, you end up with a, a rough surface. So just keep that in mind. The other thing too is uh, some people, not everybody has access to a good snowboard or they don't have places to store them. So there's nothing wrong with the seasonal, taking a portion of your grant and allocating that towards snow removal. Because like I said, it's, it's the biggest challenge is uh, snow removal. Uh, me personally, I've, I've gotten in the habit of using my own commercial grade snowboards. I have a, a 13 horse errands. It, it throws the snow far. They're not cheap, they'll cost you $4,000. But if you, if you amortize that over say a five year period, you, say you take $800 out of your budget every year, you can save up your money and get yourself a decent snowboard. The big advantage, you gotta have a place to store it though. And again, because I back right onto it, uh, onto the park, it's handy for me. I can just store it in my heated garage. But uh, if you don't have a storage, a lot of rinks have these storage bunkers now, so that makes it convenient. Uh, the big advantage about the snowblower, a, a good quality snowblower, I'm not talking about a Canadian Tire 10 horsepower special. Here. I'm talking about a 32 inch, 13 horsepower, at least uh, 12, 13 horse so that you can throw the snow. Because if you're not throwing it far enough, you're blowing the same snow two or three times. And when you get 25 centimeters, uh, that, it's just not up to that task. So get a good snowboard. The advantage is, is that I don't have to wait. Like many of these commercial operators, got their own, they have their own clients that they have to service before they can get to your rink. So you might, be, you might have to wait a day, two days sometimes, depending on how, many, uh, how much snow came down. My advantage is I can get out there right away. I don't have to wait for them. And if, if there's a forecast of say 20 centimeters of snow, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll go out there when it's halfway into the storm and I'll blow it off. Even if it's still snowing, I don't wait. I'll just go blow off that 10 centimeters. And then once the storm ends, I've only got 10 or 12 centimeters left to blow. And within two hours, we're up and running. So that's the big advantage there. The, So just so I mentioned some of the equipment uh, that you'll need, your, your plastic scrapers, snow shovels, hammer, pliers, flashlights, block the ice. Uh, the photo on the right shows some of the other tools that I use. You've got a, a heavy duty, heavy duty uh, crowbar there. And those are, those are handy for pulling out those brackets I was telling you about, those uh, inner brackets. Uh, ice scraper for cleaning, uh, cleaning up ice along the edges. Uh, and also the sledgehammer. A five pound sledgehammer is probably one of the most practical tools you've got out there to free up your nets, to free up your benches, uh, uh, picnic tables. It's, it's a handy tool. Uh, the photo on the lower left shows the first aid kit that you need, the broom that I talked about, um, and the nozzle, the red nozzle. Uh, you, like I said, they'll, they'll talk about it, but you can get them at Preston Hardware, they're not that expensive. And then uh, the photo on the upper left hand side is uh, the type of uh, A-frame uh, uh, that I use for signage. And signage is important because uh, I'll explain it a bit later on, but uh, in this particular case, it's a local real estate company. They give me uh, a bit of money for advertising and I get to use their, their frames and their signage whenever I have to post notices to, uh, to the users. So the common problem, shell ice I've talked about, uh, heavy snowfall again, uh, it's, you know, if you're gonna get 15 to 25 centimeters of snow, the, the, it's a challenge for anybody. Uh, it's a lot of work and unfortunately, snow removal just doesn't add one ounce to the quality of your ice, it's just work. So that, that's the part that's hardest of all is the snow removal. So you wanna get a good handle on how you're gonna tackle that. Uh, 
one of the big challenges too is when you get these uh, these bad storms, you know, a mix of heavy snow, freezing rain, or a mix of snow and rain. Uh, one of the challenges is to keep people off the ice. And, and how do you handle it? How do you tackle the problem? They're all unique. There's no simple formula. As a general rule, you're always going to be better off to remove the snow. If they're caught, if you're getting snow and then they're forecasting rain, if you can get that snow off before the rain comes, generally speaking, you're going to be better off in the long run. Uh, what happens if you don't get that snow off and the rain comes on top of it, you've got this wet, heavy stuff. Snow blowers aren't designed to remove that. Uh, the other problem that you're going to have is you've got snow, you've got a, a rain on top and then a flash freeze. If you've got people walking out onto it, uh, they'll create these huge slush tracks, and that if that freezes, you got a major problem on your hands. You got a lot. Of, you basically have to rebuild your base ice. So these are things you've got to be careful about. But as a general rule, if you can get that snow off before the rain comes, you'll be farther ahead. There, I've even seen a situation, and it's a gamble, but I've seen where you get so much snow uh, that, and then it's followed by rain. If you haven't got, if you can't get at it, you can actually take a chance and let the rain sit on top of the snow, flash freeze, it crystallizes, and then you've got a crust, and once you break through that crust, you're down to clean snow, and your ice is fine. But it's a gamble to do that, but it, it has worked in the past, and sometimes you don't have any choice, right? You, you just can't get out of here. You've got day jobs or whatever. Next slide. Uh, this is a... This particular photo I took, it was, uh, this happened back in 2014. We had a, an early start to the season. Uh, I was up and running by December the 18th. Uh, I started December the 18th, and by the 21st, we were up and running. Unfortunately, on the 23rd, we ended up with a five-day meltdown. Uh, it was, there was rain, there was just above zero temperatures for five days in a row. Lost all the snow. But because of the, that packed, three inches of ice uh, uh, base that I was talking about, I was able to, for the most part, withstand that meltdown. Now, the problem I had is that after the, after the meltdown, a cold front moved in, but there was, and it was, it was plenty cold, it was like minus 15, but there was no snow in the forecast. And without the snow, it's a problem because if I flood, I'm losing all my water, it's draining down the low ends. So I had to find some snow, so I ended up uh, going to one of the local rinks, they dump it in, in piles behind the rinks all the time with the Zamboni, so. I had a trailer and I got a bunch of snow. I made some banks up, built up my banks along the low parts. And I also made some slush and plugged my holes and we were back up and running uh, within a couple of days. So that worked out okay. Uh, line work, uh, this is something that I used to do. I did it for four or five years and there's no question it adds a real wow factor to your rink that you can get blue lines and red lines, and face off circles and it, it's fun but it creates problems. Uh, what happens is that uh, you get a form of shell ice uh, underneath these lines because uh, as, as the winter wears on, the elevation of the sun is more intense and the dark colors attract the heat and the water, the ice underneath the colors starts melting. So it's dangerous because you can have skate blades breaking through that and whatnot. So if you're going to do it, uh, you want to do it as early as possible into the season, like where you're not likely to get a meltdown, do it early January, mid-January. And then by the time uh, February rolls around, you've got <coughs> enough of a thick base above the line where it, it shouldn't be too much of a factor to do it. I personally don't, I've stopped doing it now for nine, 10 years, I don't do it anymore. Uh, next picture. Next slide. Except, okay, I say I don't do lines anymore, but uh, for the last uh, few years, we've been running outdoor curling bond spills on our side ring, and then once, uh, once the bond spills are over, I have to leave those covered up with snow. So basically, I start off with a side ring that's 120 feet by 60 feet wide, and then by the time I cover up the rings, uh, then the side ring is down to uh, 60 by 60. But uh, we have a lot of fun with that, with community bond spills. We, we do that instead of a, a carnival, or whatever, per se. Uh, we have a lot of fun with that. So again, I just want to mention, the, my technique is not the only way of doing things. Everybody's got their own way of doing it, depending on your tools and your health. Uh, what you have at your disposal will dictate your methods. Um, I mentioned the outdoor rink manual that the city has. It's a great resource. 
Uh, honestly, it talks about the whole process, about packing your base, different techniques on how to do that. And again, the only thing I would, the only caveat I would say is the, the part about leaving the brackets and I take those out. But uh, apart from that, I hope I didn't scare you off too much with all the work involved with snow blowing, but snow removal is a big job. But uh, hopefully uh, you'll end up with promising careers. Thank you very much. We can open it up right now. If you have questions, it's a great opportunity to ask questions about anything that you'd like to, to know about uh, rebuilding, and I will answer them the best we can. Just really quick, what was that? Uh, it used to there. Uh, used to buy these things at a hardware stores, Canadian Tire. It was called a rink rake. It was made out of half-inch PVC tubing. It was about uh, two and a half, three feet wide. So when I saw that, I basically brought it to a welder and I said, can you make me one of these 10 feet wide or eight feet wide? That's, that's, so I didn't invent the name Rink Rake. It's a, it's a copyright name or whatever. But it was called a Rink Rake. This is 20 years ago. Yeah, that's not a problem. Blowing through snow through that is not a problem, uh, and it's only on the end boards, right? It's just on the end boards. Yeah, where the headache was uh, Bayshore or some of these other centering, they've got that that uh, metal mesh all the way around, so you you're fighting that all the time because when you're trying to clean off your rink with just shovel, you're you're throwing it in half and it keeps coming back at you. You know, it's frustrating exercise. Yeah. There's your uh, one of your bad. <coughs> Yeah, so that's the that's the final, the third stage where I drag it with that wire mesh. You end up with a fairly smooth surface. That's at Bayshore though, so it's a flat surface to begin with. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, I usually put about, I usually throw mine up no more than a third, depends on how much snow you're dealing with, uh, which I should mention, like, you know, we've got a situation now, I can handle 10 to 15 centimeters with my roller, but if I get more than that, uh, it's a problem. I can't handle 20, 25 centimeters of snow to pack down. That's a lot of snow to try and pack. So what you want to do is a couple of options. One of them is once you get 15 centimeters down, pack that so that any subsequent snowfall you'll be able to handle that. Another option is to remove it, you know, if you, you don't want any more than 20 centimeters. If you've got more than 20 centimeters of snow to try and pack, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do it with my ATV and my roller and uh, it, it would be a challenge for, to, to get that properly packed down. No, I've never tried that. There's nothing wrong with it, though. It's a great low effort. Yeah. No, I've never tried it. It often freezes up, but <laughs> I, I've seen it somewhere too. I think some, I saw it somewhere else though, where somebody had a sprinkler going. It's a, it's a good idea. But are you dealing with a one-inch fire hose? I guess you've got an adapter. And or you just using a foam rubber guard. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that that, that would take quite a while. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, just to, to pair on that, uh, for packing in the snow, uh, we're a puddle race, right? We have snow and the ice on grass. And what I've done is, is this week and next week, the perfect weather actually to pack down the snow. Just use the water and do a fine spray, and it just weighs down the snow itself, and the snow literally packs down. If you do it three or four or five days in a row, it's right around zero degrees. Um, it seems to work really well. It just, by putting just a little bit of water, just like, just think, a yeah. little bit gray, and it still will pack itself down. It will actually end up packing uh, all by itself. Just a little water. Yeah. You need cold weather though. Well, you need, actually need weather like this. You need right around zero. Yeah. Uh, with a little bit of snow, and we've already done it once, and the, the snow just packs itself down. It, it weighs on itself and it slowly breaks way down. If it gets too cold, you can't. So right around zero is perfect. That's what awesome. we're doing at our stand match this week.
Lastly, yeah, when I leave shoveled out for uh, the people that use our rink, I leave my shoveled out, but only plastic shovels. Uh, so they can use them anytime to clean off the ice between games. Whoever I have on duty, I encourage them to pick up a shovel, and then once they pick up a shovel, the other one's kind of, oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> maybe we'll help this guy. So then they'll clean it all off. I've got plenty of shovels. But my metal shovels, I do not leave them out exactly for that reason. Because once they start getting beat up and banged around, they get these little wows in them and all this and then they don't do a great job but if you can protect those shovels and you will because you're paying a hundred bucks a piece for them uh, you, you just save those for yourself and for your your helper and you, you use those for the pre-flood scrape and you you put them away don't leave them out because they'll get banged up i guarantee you how many seasons do they last through uh, one <clears throat> yeah they'll you know they'll last uh three four years and again it all depends on on how, how you take care of them, how you, uh, how you maintain them. Once they start getting waves in them, then it's a problem. It's time to get another shovel. Hey, you know. But like I said, I, I usually replace mine. I, I have two, I have three of them, and I'll usually replace one every couple of years. Is there any further questions? Right. Thank you, Al. Thanks.